Please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, and I'll be reading verses 25 to 30. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and has been distressed, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am all the more anxious to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. May God bless the reading of his word. I've given the, the message title Christian Character to my talk today, but since Dennis has already done a great job of expositing the Christian character as seen in the Apostle Paul and his disciple Timothy, I should have given this message the title of Christian Character Part 2. But actually, I will explore three separate features of this passage of Scripture and in the following order. First, the character of Epaphroditus. And secondly, Epaphroditus' situation. And finally, Paul's instructions for Epaphroditus, for the Philippian church, and for all churches. However, I'll spend most of my time expounding upon the character of Epaphroditus. And then I'll take about 10 minutes to talk about his situation and Paul's instructions to Epaphroditus and to the Philippian church and to all churches in general. So feature number one, Paul refers to Epaphroditus as my brother fellow worker and fellow soldier, and he refers to him as a messenger and minister whom the Philippian church sent to take care of his needs. So let's look at these terms, brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, messenger, and minister, to discover the detailed meaning of each term. And in so doing, we will discover the unfathomable riches that we have as a family united in Christ Jesus. I think the very most important thing, and it's the first thing Paul mentions, is that he refers to Epaphroditus as brother. What does Paul mean when he refers to someone as brother? The term brother, as Paul uses it, is particularly rich in meaning. So listen closely as we explore its significance. The word means brother as in they are part of my family, or brother as in we have the same parents. But since Paul was a Jew from Tarsus, and Epaphroditus was a Gentile from Philippi, it's obvious that Paul is not talking about Epaphroditus being his blood relative. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the family of God. And the following verses will help us to understand the weight of what that means. Mark chapter 3, verse 35. Jesus said, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Romans 8, verse 29, the Apostle Paul said, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, the writer to the Hebrews said, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. 
In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. First of all, when Paul says brother, I think we can safely assume he means brother or sister in Christ, based on what is said in Mark chapter 3, verse 35. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, if you're offended by the other passages that I just quoted, because they incorporate both male and female genders within the masculine pronoun brother, well, that's a subject for another sermon at another time. Meanwhile, you can trust that there is a good reason why the Bible, the Word of God, is written this way, and that ultimately there is no partiality with God. The Apostle Paul said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. So we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The second scripture that I just read, Romans 8, 29, tells us that those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So as brothers, we will bear the image of Christ. When the Holy Spirit completes his work of sanctification, when we are fully conformed on that day, when he catches us up to meet with him in the air, and what a glorious day that will be, it will be recognizable that we bear the image of Christ. We will bear his image, but we won't be him. We won't be the original. We won't be Christ because he is the firstborn among many brothers. According to God's law, the firstborn received, among other things, a double portion of his father's estate, Deuteronomy chapter 21. And in the case of the monarchy, the firstborn was also heir to the throne. But these were just shadows of the inheritance of the firstborn. Jesus is not only the firstborn among many brothers, he is also the image of the invisible God, the express image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. Jesus is the authentic Son of God. He is truly human and truly God. We are human, redeemed sinners, and we are being conformed to his image. He is preeminent. We are not. We will be conformed to his image, but we won't be him. We want to be Christ. Only Christ is preeminent. Christ is the preeminent, firstborn from the dead among many brothers in the family of God. And finally, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, tells us that Jesus will tell God, will tell of God's name to his brothers, that in the midst of the congregation, that's us, he, God the Son, will sing God the Father's praise. And this verse goes on further to say that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. The Apostle Paul referred to Epaphroditus as brother because he was a brother in Christ. 
Do you want Jesus to call you brother, to call you sister? Do you want to see the day when Jesus stands in the midst of the congregation, the congregation that includes all believers, and hear Jesus, God the Son, tell you all about God the Father, and then to hear him sing, to hear Jesus sing praises to God the Father. That is the weight behind what it means to belong to the family of God and to be called brother. This is how John Piper puts it, with some paraphrasing from me. The reason that it is fitting for Christ to suffer in order to lead many sons to glory and thus many brothers into brotherhood and glory is that this suffering expresses his being the good, beautiful, and intimate brother. This is the perfect capstone on God's design to create a family that is so that is so unified and so deeply interwoven and full of compassion for each other with the perfect oldest brother who has gone through all of the pain of the rest of the children. What adds weight and wonder and affection to our worship of Christ is that it is the combination on the one hand of the exalted uniqueness of Jesus as the Son of God, and on the other hand, his utter condescension to share our nature as humans and our suffering as fallen mortals. And all of this so that he could beget a family and we could be included in that divine family with Christ as the ever-exalted and superior, unique, divine, older brother. It is a glorious picture. You can be born again into the family of God today, today, today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 4 verse 7. Now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. God is not far from each one of us. And now he commands all people everywhere to repent and turn away from your futile thinking and turn away from your futile way of life and surrender to Christ because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And that man is Jesus Christ. And he has given us assurance of this by raising him from the dead. You can be born again today into the family of God and be known to Jesus as brother, as sister. Epaphroditus was a brother and a fellow worker. The kingdom of God is in heaven. One day it will come here to earth. That is why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meanwhile, there's work to do here on earth for the kingdom of God. And it's important to remember that this work is to be done in fellowship with other kingdom workers. That is, we are to be fellow workers with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God's people are not a congregation of mavericks and loners. They are brothers and sisters who together are the body of Christ, and they are also fellow workers in Christ. So what is the work then 
that these fellow workers are meant to be doing here on earth for the kingdom of God. The work for the kingdom of God is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make disciples. Mark chapter 16 verse 15 tells us that Jesus said, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And Matthew chapter 27 verses 19 and 20 tell us that Jesus also said, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we can see from these two passages of Scripture that the work for the kingdom of God has at least two distinct parts to it, proclaiming and discipling, which includes teaching and baptizing. So first, let's look at proclaiming the gospel, or we could say the work of evangelism. There are three basic facets to evangelism, speaking, writing, and being. In 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 13, the Apostle Paul said, We believe, and so we speak. So one facet of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ is to vocally preach the gospel by speaking to your family, friends, neighbors, and anyone else who comes across your path about the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Another facet of proclaiming the gospel is to write about it or produce and or distribute written material or videos about it, such as writing cards and letters to your unsaved family and friends, or writing and distributing tracts, or sharing Christian videos. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 tell us that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The third facet of proclaiming the gospel of Christ is just being. That is, to be living evidence of its life-changing power by living salty, gospel-illuminating lives of good deeds. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. As the Holy Spirit progressively sanctifies us, as he does that work of purification in our lives, we will bear the fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit will be evident by our deeds, our good works. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession that are zealous for good works. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Effective evangelism requires wisdom and grace. Wisdom and grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. 
The work of evangelism is easier for some than it is for others. But the important thing to remember is that we are to do the work of evangelism as fellow workers in Christ. You're not meant to be a lonely prophet wandering about the streets of the city dressed in sackcloth and ashes. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 to 9. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the increase. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's talk about discipling. First and foremost, discipling is about being a good role model. It's a ministry of showing others how the Christian life is to be lived here on earth in unity with other Christians. Philippians 3, verse 17. The Apostle Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So, by definition, discipling is hard work, and it cannot be accomplished without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the work, but he does the work through us. And we must strive for the goal, the goal of setting a good example for others to follow. And that good example will include a model of purity in Christ and an illustration of how brethren live together in unity as fellow workers in Christ. Hebrews 12 verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Discipling also includes teaching and baptizing. Not everyone is gifted to be a teacher of the Word of God, but ironically, every Christian does teach the Word of God, at least to some extent. Is it possible for a Christian to live out their entire life here on earth without teaching the Bible at least to some degree to someone else? For example, to their spouse, to their children, their friends, and so on. Mature Christians, as fellow workers in Christ, are continually, in word and deeds, teaching new Christians the precepts of the Bible and how those precepts are to be incorporated in the Christian way of life. Mother and father teach their children the Word of God. Their marriage represents Christ and the Church. They are husband and wife, and they are fellow workers in Christ. Older children are fellow workers who teach their younger brothers and sisters and friends the Bible stories that they have learned from their parents, and so on. Baptizing. Teaching part of discipling includes teaching the doctrine of baptism, and that includes teaching the importance of being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, we are commanded to teach other Christians to observe all that Christ has commanded us to do. Therefore, it should automatically follow that upon receiving this teaching, new Christians would want to be baptized and there would be pastors and elders readily available to baptize them. And all of these people, the teachers and the baptizers, are all fellow workers in Christ. Epaphroditus was a brother 
a fellow worker and a fellow soldier. Obviously, Paul is not talking about being a soldier in the Roman army or any earthly army. He's talking about the army of God. There's so much that could be said about God's army and our war against sin and our battles against arguments and every lofty opinion that is raised against the knowledge of God. But I will limit my focus to what it means to be a soldier and a fellow soldier in God's army. I'm retired from paid employment, but I'm still a worker in the body of Christ. The church, the local church here at FBC, I'm a fellow worker with all of you. I enjoy work. I enjoy that. Work is fruitful and it's satisfying. And working together with like-minded people is enjoyable. Whether it's putting together a video for the Sunday service or it's building a fence, working with fellow workers in Christ is satisfying. It brings joy. It's fruitful. Soldier work is different. If you are a fellow worker in Christ, that means you are willing to put your shoulder to the wheel with like-minded fellow workers to spread the gospel in word and in deed, and it's fruitful and it's enjoyable. When you're a fellow soldier, a fellow soldier in Christ, it means you are willing to put your entire life on the line for the glory of Christ. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, about soldiers in Christ. They share in suffering. They don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. Their aim is to please the one who enlisted them. They share in suffering. They don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. Their aim is to please the one who enlisted them. So first of all, let's look at this suffering. Fellow soldiers in Christ share in suffering. Do you remember the story about Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas and John Mark, as recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 13? John Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Cyprus. But after they sailed from there and landed at Perga in Asia, he left them. When referring to the incident later, as recorded in Acts chapter 15, Luke says that John deserted them. The island of Cyprus was the home of Barnabas. Acts chapter 4 tells us that. And John Mark may have been well familiar with the island since he was a cousin of Barnabas. Colossians chapter 4 tells us that. But Asia and Perga were probably something completely different and maybe even scary for him. Maybe he was afraid or homesick or both. Whatever the reason, he did not soldier on with Paul and Barnabas. It appears that he no longer wanted to share in their ministry because he feared that it might mean suffering for him. It's important to note that the story about John Mark has a happy ending. He didn't give up forever. Through the grace of God working in his life, he overcame the misgivings that he had on that first missionary journey, and he came back into service to the Apostle Paul, as we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Fellow soldiers don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. If I took the literal translation, I could phrase it this way. Fellow soldiers in Christ don't get entangled in the affairs of this life or this world, 
Or I could say, fellow soldiers in Christ, don't get entangled in worldly pursuits. How about Demas? Do you remember him? In his letter to Philemon, verse 24, Paul said Demas was a fellow worker in Christ. Later, he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, and said, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What happened? Demas fell in love with the world. That's what happened. I think that Demas fell in love with the world because he first got entangled with worldly pursuits. I don't think he just woke up one day and said, wow, I'm in love with the world. Beware of getting entangled with worldly pursuits. It's easy to do, so beware. I'm worried about a couple of friends of mine in the United States because they're following this fad of maintaining what is known as a bucket list. A bucket list is a list of things that you must do before you die. And I'm worried about what my friends might be putting on their lists, what things they consider to be top priority to do before they die. And I'm worried that they may end up with the bucket list leading their lives instead of the Word of God leading their lives and the Holy Spirit leading their lives. The Bible already tells us what we must do before we die. Repent and be baptized. Then pick up our cross and follow Jesus, making disciples of all nations. Are the things that my friends are putting on their lists supportive of this? There's a danger that the bucket list will draw them into a love of worldly pursuits. And the conclusion of love for worldly pursuits is love for the world itself. And the Bible gives a severe warning about this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Demas fell in love with the world, <clears throat> and he therefore no longer wanted to soldier on with the Apostle Paul. So beware of entanglements with the world. The Bible says that a soldier's aim is to please the one who enlisted him, who enlisted us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God the captain of our salvation. That's who enlisted us. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hebrews 2 verse 10. And that's the King James translation. And in my humble opinion, the other translators should have stayed with that term, the captain of their salvation. Christ, the captain of our salvation. Therefore, our aim should be to please Christ, the one who enlisted us to be soldiers of the cross. You recall the story of Simon, the sorcerer, as told in the book of Acts chapter 8. Simon practiced sorcery. And the people in the city where he lived paid attention to him because they were amazed by his magic. He was considered to be someone great. Then Peter and John came to the city where he lived. Now it was Simon who was amazed by the signs and wonders that 
Peter and John perform it. When Simon first heard the gospel, the Bible says that he believed and was baptized. But it must have been a shallow, short-lived belief and a baptism under false pretenses because when Simon saw people receive the Holy Spirit after Peter and John had laid hands on them, he immediately asked if he could purchase this gift of laying on of hands for himself. Why? So he could please the captain of his salvation? No. I think he sought to buy this gift so he could be somebody great again. Acts chapter 8 verse 22 says, the intent of his heart was evil. He didn't want to soldier on in God's army. He wanted to be, once again, great in the eyes of the people. His goal was to please himself, not the captain of his salvation. Epaphroditus was a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, and a messenger. The word messenger here means sent one. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Epaphroditus brought good news to Paul. The people in Philippi were still thinking about him, praying for him. But he not only brought good news to Paul, he also brought good supplies. And it would have been no small thing to entrust someone with the task of transporting supplies from Philippi to Rome. The overland route between the two cities is about 2,000 miles, 2,000 kilometers long. The route that requires uh, you to go through the Adriatic Sea, shorter, about 1,400 kilometers. In either case, the journey would have been dangerous, especially for a Christian. Just read the Apostle Paul's accounts of his own journeys through these regions during that same time period. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 26. On frequent journeys, I was in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. There's no reason to think that Epaphroditus' journey would have been much different. It's yet another testimony to the character of Epaphroditus, that he was selected to be the Philippian church messenger to Paul in Rome. So Epaphroditus was a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, a messenger, and a minister. The word minister here means an official servant who works for the good of the community. Now, Epaphroditus not only delivered good news and supplies to Paul, he stayed on to minister to Paul's needs and to work for the good of the gospel. What was his motivation for doing this? He did it for the name of Jesus. He did it because he loved the name of Jesus. God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, Hebrews 6.10. He did it not to please himself. He did it because he wanted to please God. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God, Hebrews 13. Verse 16, and all of this came at a cost, a cost to Epaphroditus, the cost of his health. He nearly died. And that concludes the character of Epaphroditus. May God, by his grace, build the character of each person in our congregation including me, so that it can be said that 
In Christ, we are brothers and sisters, fellow workers, fellow soldiers, messengers and ministers of God. What a character that would be. At this time in world history, with the impact of the coronavirus, the world needs Christ and the church, and the church needs this kind of character. If God blesses this church with a congregation in which all of the members possess this kind of character, then this church would be like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Feature number two, Epaphroditus's situation. And now I'm coming to a conclusion. Epaphroditus had just recovered from a severe illness. He fell sick and nearly died while ministering to Paul's needs. According to Paul, Epaphroditus risked his life to complete his mission of ministry on behalf of the Philippian church. Paul said that God had mercy not on Epaphroditus alone, but on Paul himself, because Paul would have suffered sorrow upon sorrow if Epaphroditus had passed away. Scripture doesn't tell us the cause of Epaphroditus's sickness, but it appears that it came about as the result of the risk that he took by traveling that long distance from Philippi to Rome. And possibly additional risks that he is likely to have taken as he moved about the city of Rome to carry out tasks for the Apostle Paul. And Paul did not criticize Epaphroditus for taking those risks. Those who truly love Christ are keen to serve him and will think it's worthwhile to take life-threatening risks to serve him and his church. And they may be criticized for taking risks. They may be criticized by their peers for being different. They may be criticized by their parents for putting aside a great education that their parents had paid for to go out into the ministry of missionary work in some far-flung region of the world where they hardly ever get a chance to see their parents again. They may be criticized by anyone except those who know what it means to be in love with Jesus. Feature number three, Paul's instructions to Epaphroditus and to the church at Philippi and to the church in general. Epaphroditus got homesick, and Paul didn't criticize him for that either. Paul said he longs for you all and is distressed because you have heard that he was ill. Paul felt that it was necessary to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi because Epaphroditus was homesick. Paul knew that the Philippians would be overjoyed to see him again. And Paul would have less concern about Epaphroditus' condition if he knew that he was back amongst his beloved Christian brothers and sisters in Philippi. Paul told the church at Philippi to receive Epaphroditus back home with honor. I'll conclude with this. We need to recognize when our brothers and sisters in Christ need a break. Epaphroditus was a brother in Christ. He was a brother of excellent character. He was a soldier in Christ who was not afraid to lay down his life for the captain of his salvation. But he was not impervious to homesickness. Nor was Paul blind to the fact that Epaphroditus was longing to go home 
and that the brothers and sisters in Philippi were equally longing to see him again. It was Paul who initiated the homecoming for Epaphroditus, despite the fact that it would have been better for Paul if Epaphroditus had remained with him in Rome. This is the meaning behind verse 4 of Philippians chapter 2. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So look after yourselves, but don't stop there. Also look after the interests of others, because sometimes the people who are close to you, your spouse, your children, your parents, your workmates, your brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes they need a break. Sometimes people close to you need a break, but they won't necessarily tell you that. That's why you need to be on the lookout for them, reading the signals, looking out for their interests as well as your own. And when it's necessary, initiate action to give them a break. This is what it means to be brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow workers, soldiers, messengers, and ministers. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 17 to 18. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus because they refreshed my spirit. Philemon 1, 7. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. 2 Timothy 1, 16. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 13. Therefore we are comforted, and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So let's look again at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Let's be conformed to the image of our Savior, our perfect firstborn brother. Many of you will be familiar with the song, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You, written by Richard Gillard. It was first published in 1978. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. Amen.